Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, I'm Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. was around the year 2000. Technology companies were doing extremely well and then suddenly most of them reported huge losses and folded. These losses created an economic cascade which came to be known as the dot-com crash. Stuck in the middle of this nuclear disaster were thousands of programmers. One of them was a woman called Kathy Sierra. If you've ever dipped your toes into a programming language like Java, you're likely to have heard of Cathy Sierra. Her book series, Head First Java, has sold well over a million copies. If you look back at the past 10 years or more, there is Sierra's book, one of the longest running bestsellers of the decade. Yet, Sierra isn't like one of those in-your-face internet marketers. She jumped off social media back in 2007 and only reluctantly got back in 2013. She speaks at conferences, but it's a rare treat. But back to Sierra's disaster story. According to Sierra, back in the late 90s and in the year 2000, anyone landing a job in a dot-com company could get stock options. And then along came the implosion of the dot-coms, and her shares were worth nothing. And this is what Sierra says. I needed a job. I am probably as old as most of your parents. If you are trying to get a job as a programmer when you are competing against people who are half your age, and granted, I was not the most awesome programmer. I was very decent. Um, And we needed regular income. I said we, because, oh yes, my husband, also a programmer, Also same age, same problem. And we had two kids and a dog. In short, Cathy Sierra was seemingly at a dead end when she wrote her first book, Head First Java. Yet, Sierra believes in the concept of consumption. Consumption is when you create a product or service that is so easy to understand, so easy to use, that progress is inevitable. Instead of floundering and flipping back to page 3 or 6 or having to refer back, the reader is able to move forward confidently. Today we're going to dig deep into that concept of consumption, but from a Sierra point of view. Now, you've followed psychotactics and you've probably heard about consumption because we've been talking about it since 2006, maybe even earlier. However, I really like Kathy's work. I really like her passion. I even like the name on her books. It says, A Brain-Friendly Guide. And though I would never bother with Java, there are three concepts of Sierra's consumption model that I would like to share with you. Ready? Well, here goes. So why do readers get stuck? Why do people get stuck? Why do your clients get stuck? There are three factors. Factor number one, the dependence on memory. Factor number two, not identifying confusion. And factor number three, The perfect life. Let's get cracking with the first factor, the dependence on memory. In a BBC documentary, Michelle Thomas, who was a master language teacher, He looks around. He looks around in a classroom full of desks. The sunlight is streaming through the windows, but Thomas's face is slightly grim, as if he is reaching for a painful memory. This reminds me of my own classrooms. As as a child, as a youngster, in high school. And it was uh, 
always uh, under stress, uncomfortable. One had to uh, associate learning with, uh, with work, with concentration, with uh, paying attention. With homework, it's all work, work. But learning shouldn't be work. Learning should be excitement. Learning should be pleasure. And one should experience a constant sense of uh, progression and learning, and one uh, would want more. That is learning to me. And uh, a teacher is uh, somebody who will facilitate and show how to learn. Thomas's classroom looks very different from the traditional classroom. The desks, they're gone. The students help cart in their own furniture, mostly sofas. Plants show up, so does a carpet, and the scene resembles a cozy version of your living room, then a classroom. Yet what Michelle Thomas says at the start of every lesson, every learning session, that is far more important. And this is what he says. Before, before starting, I'm going to set up a very important rule, a very important ground rule. And that rule is for you never to worry about remembering. Never to worry about remembering anything and therefore not to try. Never to try to remember anything from one moment to the next. This is a method with responsibility for your remembering and for learning is in the teaching. So if at any point there's something you don't remember, this is not your problem. It will be up to me to know why you don't remember individually and what to do about it. Kathy Sierra calls this phenomenon the page vaporizer moment. So what is the page vaporizer moment? Sierra describes it in this way. Imagine that you've written a book and when the user turns the page, the previous page vaporizes. There is no going back. No one can ever turn back. It's not even an option. What would you do differently to make this work for them? There is no rewind. It's just one time. It's like they're sitting in a theater watching a movie. What would you do? Michelle Thomas died in 2005, but the message lingers on. Never try to remember anything from one moment to the next. That's almost exactly what Kathy Sierra is saying. That the dependence on memory is a problem. It means that you as a teacher, writer, as a video creator, you're not doing your job as well as you should. Kathy Sierra and her husband, they weren't writers. They just loved Java so intimately. It was the one thing they adored, and so they decided to write about it. They didn't know squat about writing or publishing. They even ran headlong into mountains of rejection slips, until finally the publisher, O'Reilly, decided to give them a chance. But the real magic or madness is that they needed the money desperately. With both of them out of a job, they needed to get their revenue from the book sales alone. Now, when Sierra and her husband sat down and expressed their source of income for the next 5, 10, 15 years, they got a hearty laugh in return. Their editor said, you're going to have to be in the top two or three selling books for this programming language. So of course they looked up Amazon and there are not 500 or 1000 results. There aren't even 10,000 results. There are a whopping 27,078 results for Java. They decided to filter the search. Even so, there are 16,348 results. And oh, by the way, no marketing budget. Nobody knows you. You're nobody. You're not a writer. You can't do this. And the whole internet says, and it's mostly just luck. And we're like, no. But Kathy and her husband knew that the book needed to work. They had kids. There was the dog. And being middle-aged means the prospects of work were terribly bleak.
They started out the process by doing what most people do. They looked at the competition. And it staggered them how many books were so fabulous. They couldn't compete with 16,000 books by simply making their book a little better. So they went for a goal that was mostly unreachable. And this goal was that they were going to write a book where the page would vaporize the moment after you read it. The problem was that most people weren't finishing the books. They were getting stuck. And everyone accepted that, says Sierra. Nobody reads programming books all the way through. We thought, how can they actually possibly learn if they don't keep reading it? It doesn't matter how great the book is. We realize that a lot of these things don't really matter if people don't keep going. So now we knew what it was that we have to do. We could compete on forward flow, just getting people to keep going. Michelle Thomas had this philosophy in place a long time ago. He started training language students in a manner that requires no memorization. Kathy Sierra's book, same thing. No need to memorize anything. It's all forward movement. Of course, if you've been following psychotactics for a while, you'll know how this forward movement works. All of the memorization problems arise because of intimidation. Let's say I asked you to go down to the store. I say, hey, go down to the store, buy me a bottle of full-fat milk. Is there anything difficult in that task? No, there's zero intimidation involved. But imagine you're in a foreign country. Now you have the burden of trying to figure out the location of the store, and then you're trying to say full fat in German or Italian or Hindi, for that matter. The moment you break down things into small bits, your client moves forward instead of being frozen on the previous page. The reason why you find a psychotactics book so easy to read is not because of some great or amazing writing. It's because of the structure of the book, the way the cartoons remind you about what you've learned, the way the summary helps you remember, the way the graphics stick around, not just for decoration, but with a perfectly good reason in mind. That reason is the lack of dependence on memory. It's not like we haven't created bad products or training before. We have. When I first started out at Psychotactics, I remember giving a workshop in Auckland. That workshop was two days long, and it had a ton of information. One person literally fell asleep after lunch. And yet, I plowed on with the training. I felt it was my job to keep the workshop going until the very last minute. I felt that Everything I did needed to be like how the world said it needed to be. I felt that books needed to be 200 pages long. And now I know better. The goal is not information, it's skill. Not information, skill. If you as the client read Kathy Sierra's books and you don't learn how to program in Java, then she has failed in her job. If you take on French or Italian or German, and Michelle Thomas doesn't make you feel like a native speaker, then he has failed. I started out writing books that were 200 pages long. And sometimes the book needs that much depth, and sometimes it doesn't. The uniqueness course notes were a little over 90 pages, I think. And the storytelling course notes, they were a lot fewer than that. We found people were going backwards, says Kathy Sierra. And they were getting confused. Getting confused is the second problem. So we go to the second point. What causes the confusion? Let's find out. The moment you bring up the term Bermuda Triangle, many of us think of the word disappear. There's a reason why we associate the disappearance with the Bermuda Triangle. Back in 1964, writer Vincent Gaddis wrote in this pulp magazine. The magazine went by the name of Agossi. And he wrote about the boundaries of the Bermuda Triangle. 
The boundaries of the Bermuda Triangle were in Miami, Florida, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and then finally in the Atlantic island of Bermuda. And it was in this triangle that planes and ships seemed to mysteriously disappear. Imagine you're a captain out at sea in the mid-Atlantic. You probably don't believe a word about the Bermuda Triangle. You know it's a myth. There is no basis for ships or planes disappearing. Yet, you know that should your vessel disappear, this would be the place where all the crazy stuff happens. You know that you're in crazy waters and you're expecting the worst and preparing for the best. Kathy Sierra recognized the Bermuda Triangle of Java programming. She knew that programmers were getting lost at certain points in time. And the reason why they lost their way was because they didn't know that they were in rough seas. As you go through a book, for instance, you move ahead progressively. Then suddenly you find yourself struggling. And the way we work through the struggle is to try and barrel our way through the problem. But then, as the confusion persists, we decide that it's too hard and we give up. When we conducted the article writing course, there is one point where everyone struggles. It's called the first 50 words. The first 50 words are the opening portion of your article, the start of your article. We all know how hard it is to get started with an article. But even so, when you're on a course, you expect that the guidance will keep you going. You've read the notes, you've listened to the audio, you've gone over the assignment. And the assignment isn't just a hit and run. The assignment stretches over the whole week. Surely that's enough to understand and then implement the lesson. But it's not. It's rough work. And as a teacher, I should have realized it earlier. But until 2015, a whole nine years after I started the article writing course, I didn't have that insight. I didn't see that problem. Only in 2015 did I allocate two whole weeks to the first 50 words. Only in 2016 did the first 50 words section move earlier in the course instead of much later. It was the roughest, toughest patch of ocean. And I didn't tell clients it was difficult. And when I mean tell, I mean I did tell them, but it's not enough to tell. You have to make changes so that the client doesn't give up. Now, a book is different from a course. A book doesn't have the teacher hovering over your assignment. You're out on your own and you don't realize that everyone is struggling at page 45. You think it's just you. And if you knew well in advance that page 45 to page 85 was going to be a Bermuda Triangle, then you'd be more watchful. But you'd also know that you'd finally be out of that triangle and that would give you impetus to battle through. This point, this one point, it's a real pain for me as a teacher. As a teacher, as a trainer, as a writer, it's like a big slap in the face. I know that there are points in every course where you run into difficulty. Well, Sometimes you know and sometimes you realize it when you see clients struggling. And yet, you're not sure what to do. If you were to tell a client that they're approaching a difficult patch, would it psych their brains? Would it make things a lot harder? Or do you let them sail right into that stretch and get hammered? And today, I tend to agree with Cathy Sierra. I tell clients, this first 50 word stuff, it's hard. It's going to make you feel like you can never get to the other side. And yet, it's not you. You're not the one that's the problem. The 50 words, that is the problem. Of course, the way to get through difficult learning is to make sure that you break things down into smaller bits. A bit like my badminton coach did when I was playing badminton back in 2008. The one thing I struggled with was overhead shots. 
The moment the opponent would hit the shuttlecock high in the air, there was a good chance I'd lose the point. Either I'd find the shot too hard to take or my return was so poor that the opponent would smash it back to my side of the court. And I thought it was just me. I didn't know that many rookie players struggle with the same overhead shot. My coach said, look, everyone struggles with this. So now we're going to break it up into four stages. So stage one was to sight the shuttlecock and get under it. Stage two was to raise my left hand up. I'm actually left-handed normally, but when I play games, it's right-handed. So I had to raise my left hand up and I had to grip that racket a bit harder. So you just squeeze on the racket. And stage three was to step forward just a little bit as if to smash. And now this puts your opponent on the defense. And stage four, I could do anything. I could smash or I could do a tiny drop shot. In my estimate, we did this routine about 800 times. Not all at once, of course. We do it for a little while, then we go back to playing a bit, and then it was back to the four stages. At first, I was completely foxed with all the four stages, but he'd always get me to do one thing at a time. To make sure that I wasn't distracted with the entire routine, he'd get me to hit an imaginary shuttlecock over and over and over again. What you're noticing here is what Kathy Sierra seems to emphasize upon. You have to tell the client what they're about to embark upon is difficult. You have to break it up into smaller bits so that the client can manage the routine. This step of identifying the confusion doesn't make the learning easier, but the client knows that the stage is temporary. They know that it's typical. They know that struggling is appropriate. And it's not just them that's having the problem, but everyone struggles at that point. Confusion is part of the learning process. Kathy Sierra's book started out as a rank outsider, then moved to a million copies. Today, it's closing in on two million copies. In the last decade, she has written just one other book. That's it. The first book alone has helped her live the life that she wants with her kids, her dog, and from what I hear, horses. Telling the client that they're facing a potential Bermuda Triangle seems to be so tiny. It almost seems insignificant, and yet it's what we all want, right? That's the second point that Kathy Sierra figured out in her journey to write a book. A journey that would beat all those 16,000 other books on Amazon. We started out with this page vaporizer business. We made things so simple that the client doesn't have to remember. And then, when things get difficult, we needed to tell the client that, hey, this is difficult. We had to tell them that. But it doesn't stop there. There is a third point, and it's called the rest of their life. But what does that mean? When I bought my fully electric car, the BMW i3, I was excited beyond words, and I'll tell you why. The car that I drove before the i3 was a Toyota Corolla. It never gave us a day of trouble in close to 10 years, but yes, it was a Toyota Corolla. A Corolla with a CD player, no fancy bits and pieces, and yes, not even a USB. Which is why I felt like an astronaut going up to the moon when I first got the i3. All of these whiz-bang buttons, automated parking, and yes, the USB and Bluetooth. Then my head went for a swim. Overwhelm filled my brain, and I had to read the manual. And this is precisely what Cathy Sierra has been railing against for the past 10 years or so. When you buy a camera, you get all these glossy representations of what the camera can do. Then you pick up that big juicy DSLR camera and you're stuck in auto mode. So why won't you go from auto mode 
to taking pictures like all those great photographers. It's because of the camera makers and the car makers and the book writers and the course creators. We pretend that the rest of our client's life doesn't exist. We somehow expect that a client will buy our book and that the dishes will get washed. While the client reads our book, the plants will get watered. We create products and services for unreal people. Instead of seeing them as readers, we need to see our clients as users. When I buy a car, I need to use it, not read a manual. When I bought that amazing camera, I was already in auto mode. I didn't need a fancy DSLR auto mode. I need to be thought of as a user, not a buyer. Not a client, not a reader. I need to be able to use what I just bought. But no, we run into stupid manuals. And I can assure you that the BMW manual is a real downer. So then we turn to the internet. That's what I did. To access the fun features of the car on an app, I had to find what is called the VIN number. That's the vehicle identification number, short VIN. And I didn't know what it meant. It wasn't on the Corolla. Oh, well, I didn't see it. So here's what I did. I did a search on Google, and guess what? I ran into a bunch of forums. And I don't know about you, but there are some real creeps on forums. Someone just like me was asking, where do you find the VIN number on the car? And these guys in the forums, they were mocking him. No one seemed to want to answer the question. They simply said, it's everywhere. Don't get me wrong. I love my i3. I found out how to use it with an amazing video on YouTube, which was made by BMW themselves. But I wish they would have treated me more like a user than a buyer. And this is what you've got to realize when you create a product or a service, a book or a course, even a presentation or a webinar. I should be able to use your advice right after I experience your product or service. I don't have time to go through yet another manual because the garbage has to be taken out, dishes are waiting to be washed, plants are waiting to be watered. Kathy Sierra goes on and on and on about this user experience. So does Michelle Thomas. And this idea of the responsibility of the learning is important. When they buy your book and do your course, and they cannot get to the end, it's because they have a life. They have a life and you didn't consider that life. You just created something that suits your needs and your ego. When you consider that clients have a life beyond your product, you design it differently. You stop writing books like they were a manual. You start writing it as though you were talking to a friend at a cafe. Of all the three points Kathy Sierra covers, this one about the rest of their lives, it's the most conceptual. It seems almost like it needs more breathing space. It needs more growing space. But there is a germ of an idea, which is why it's here in this podcast. The idea that if your product isn't sort of self-explanatory, then the rest of my life starts to take over. And then I, as a buyer of your product or service, I don't get to enjoy it as much as I could or I should. Considering that users have a life makes you more of a compassionate creator of products, of courses, of webinars, of presentations. It stops making you this rock star and starts making you a teacher. You realize that somehow you need to write or create things in a way that bestow a superpower. You can just do one superpower, but the client gets to use that power. They get to use an, another power and another power. And this is despite life sneaking in. This last point that we just covered, it's a bit shaky, but it's something that we need to think about. Because even if we were to ignore this last point, the entire message is strong. 
So let's review what we've just learned, shall we? Let's get to the summary. We covered three points, three factors really. Factor one was to get yourself a page vaporizer. Can I remember what you just said? Do you remember what I just said? No. If I have to go back and you have to go back several times, then the message was probably too complex or maybe it was too long. To sort out the problem of memory, you have to use graphics and cartoons and captions and yes, a summary like this one. So point one was about the page vaporizer that once you've moved on, the client cannot go back. So you create your products and your services and your presentations and your podcasts in this manner. The second factor is remarkably simple. It's to tell the clients when they're headed to dangerous waters. Clients feel like they're the only ones who are not getting it, when in fact, everyone is not getting it. If something is difficult, tell them it's difficult. Like, for instance, this last point about having a life. I get the point conceptually, but it's hard to understand what am I going to do with it. So, as the podcaster, I have to tell you that it's a difficult point. It's not just you. I'm not getting it either. So, we have these two points. The first is the vaporizer, and second is telling clients when things are going to be difficult. And then we get to the last point, which is the point I was having the most difficulty with. And it's the distinction between a user and a client. Because a user has a life, and that user needs to be seen as a user so that they can use the camera and they can use the software and not have to go through a stupid manual because they have a life. And if your product or service is not easy, then that life is going to step in and they're going to give up. So what is the one thing that you can do today? There is one thing that you can do right away, and that is to tell your clients when things are going to be difficult. And then tell them where the all clear is going to show up. So say you've got a book, you say at 45, it's going to get difficult. At 85, things are going to get clear again. And that's the simplest, most effective thing you can do today. The responsibility for the learning lies with the teacher. If you don't understand something, it's not your fault. It's mine. So said Michelle Thomas. As a parent, as a trainer, as a presenter, coach, or even a writer, it's easy to blame the student. Michelle Thomas would disagree. I would recommend that you watch some of the videos on YouTube by Michelle Thomas. It's a series by the BBC, and it's quite interesting, very entertaining. Also read Kathy Sira's non-Java book. It's called Badass, Making Users Awesome. And with that, we come to the end of this podcast. Do you want to find out what's happening in psychotactics land? That's coming up right away. So it was 4.30 a.m., I think, and I was reading my email. And I got a message from Kai Huang, and he lives in Chicago. And he said, I listened to your episode number 50 on the train. And episode number 50 was all about our move to New Zealand. And if you haven't heard that, you should. And he said, your journey was more challenging than I expected when you first started out Psychotactics. And this is what he goes on to say. He says, definitely talk a little bit about this history when you first started because we're eager to know more about it. I guess when so many people ask you about the early days, they do not just want to hear the stories. They're probably also thinking, well, what did Sean do when he was at a lower status level or at our level so that we can follow him or at least get some ideas from it? We tend to lean on the successful examples or even templates to lower our feeling of risk or lack of safety. And 
Of course, he then said, please forgive me for talking too much. You don't have to respond to this. But the thing is that I respond to all the email. And if you need to write to me for any reason, you can. You don't have to be a paying customer. You no need to have bought anything from us. You can still write. And I write back. So that's just something that you should know. Guy also sent me a bunch of questions, which I will cover in probably the very next episode. So... If you have questions, send them in and I can cover them. Now, as far as what's happening in Psychotactics land, the first thing that's coming up is the article writing home study on the 17th of September. That's when we're going to release 30 copies. Just the home study, not a live course. The live course is not until mid-2017, but the 17th of September, 2016, that's when the home study gets released. If you're in 5000 BC, you get first preference. If the 30 copies go before we get to the psychotactics list, they're gone. There's also the pre-sale course, which will be out on the 15th of October. This is just a document, but what kind of document is it? It's expensive. And the reason why it's expensive is it shows you what we do. We have no joint ventures, no affiliates, no advertising, no Facebook ads, nothing. And we work with very small audiences, like 400, 500 people. And all the courses get filled up faster than pretty much anyone on the internet. Some of the courses get filled in 20 minutes. The reason why this works is because we go through a very elaborate system of pre-selling. And that's what will be available on the 15th of October. So mark your calendar for that date. Those are the two things that are showing up in the next month or so. Other than that, there's the membership at 5000 BC. And if you're not a member, then you can already tell that they get first preference for everything. I answer a whole bunch of questions. There's a lot more to 5000 BC than just another membership site. And talking about membership sites, I spoke about it in this podcast itself. You know, most membership sites are rude. They're crass. They're always self-promoting. And... If you've been to one of those membership sites and you think of the complete polar opposite, that is 5000 BC. One last thing and we're done. A couple of episodes ago, I spoke about the whole Ayurveda treatment and how I've changed my eating habits and how this whole treatment kind of changed the way my health status looked. And so a lot of people have asked where they can go. Now, if you're in India or you're headed towards India, this is in Goa. And you can always email me for specific details. But the course is called Virechna Karma, which is V-I-R-E-C-H-A-N-A. And like how you say karma, we don't say it. We say karma. So that's K-A-R-M-A. And look it up and maybe someone does something similar where you are but obviously, India is the place to go. That's pretty much it from Psychotactics Land. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I really enjoyed creating this one, this one specifically. And I'll be back with Kai Huang's question in the very next episode. That's me from Psychotactics Land saying bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>